Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of What We Can't Not Talk About, the podcast of the Austin Institute for the Study of Family and Culture. I'm Dr. Mariana Orlandi, host of the show, and today I am thrilled to introduce you to the best-selling author of The Toxic War on Masculinity, How Christianity Reconciles the Sexes, Professor Nancy Piercy. Good afternoon, Nancy, and welcome on our show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Professor Piercy is also the author of Love Thy Body, The Soul of Science, Saving Leonardo, Finding Truth, and Total Truth. She is professor and scholar in residence at Houston Christian University and has been quoted in the New Yorker and Newsweek, highlighted as one of the five top women apologists by Christianity Today and hailed in The Economist as America's preeminent evangelical Protestant female intellectual. I invited her on her show because her latest book, The Toxic War of Masculinity, resonated not only with me, but with several other scholars who are equally engaged and focused on understanding the profound and different reasons that led to the current chaos um, affecting rel the relationships world. She's quoted in most of the contemporary literature that we read during our programs and reading groups. And, and I believe that what we will say today will also resonate with several young men who do not know what to do about the label that too often I think is attached to them, which is toxic. So that said, I think that most of those who follow us, women in particular, would not deny that, quote unquote, a good man is truly hard to find, uh, and now more than ever. But the question with which I would like to start this conversation is, is it possible that just as women were at least partially deceived when they were told that denying their maternity was a great form of empowerment, that is it maybe possible that also men were given and served a false narrative? Is it possible that their current toxicity is not the inevitable result of a domineering nature that they just have, they're born with it, but it's rather a response to a lack of education, lack of models that point them to what a good man actually is? So this... Uh, Nancy, if you agree, are the questions that we will try to answer today with you. And so, again, thank you for, uh, for accepting your invitation on our show, and I know you're very busy, um, so thank you for that. Now, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I just, I love what, I love the work that the Austin Institute does. I love the books that you've put out, so I'm very honored to be here. Thank you. Uh, sad from, you know, you're mentioned and you're quote, like cited um, in most of the things we read. So uh, having this, something like this said by you, it means a lot to me. Uh, before we get started on the book, your latest book, um, I know I already introduced you and I said, you know, uh, a lot of things about you that people can Google. But I was wondering if there's anything else that you think is relevant about your life or your scholarship, something that may help also our audience understand better who you are um, as a person and that I left out. Oh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question because um, I do start the book with a personal story. Um, and I, I grew up in a very abusive home. My father was severely physically abusive. He, he didn't say, do this, I'll spank you. He'd say, do this, or I'll beat you. And he's quite open about it. And he would beat us with his fist and, and kicking and so on. And so naturally, when I became a young adult, I ricocheted off into extreme feminism mm -hmm. um, and read all the classic books, the foundational books like Betty Friedan and Simone de Beauvoir and Kate Millett, uh, Susan Brown Miller. I always had some feminist book on my bedside table that I was reading. Um, and then I did become a Christian in college um, through the work of Francis Schaeffer at Libri. At, uh, Libri is in the Swiss... Uh, it's in the French speaking part of Switzerland. So Libri means the shelter. And Francis Schaeffer was known for his apologetics ministry. And it was his apologetics arguments that persuaded me that Christianity was true. And then I sort of had to rethink the whole question of men and masculinity and feminism. So I was interviewed by a Christian psychologist who said, well, at least we know you're not writing from an ivory tower 
<laughs> you're writing from the trenches because you really did have to think through these things in a very personal way. So that's kind of the prologue to the book is that it's not just an academic interest. It has been something that's been intensely personal. Okay. Um, I, and again, you know, there's always this thing that I need to ask questions that I sometimes know the answer to because I did read the book. So there are things, but at the same time, there is something that I was thinking about. It's like, this is not your first book and it's not your, it's not your first book on topics that somehow have something to do with these topics. So can you, do you see looking back if there is a path that you followed in your scholarship and in the books that, that have preceded that? And, you know, why this book and why this book now? Like, uh, was it, yeah, did it take some years to get to these conclusions? Or was, was it like there are other steps that one needs to make before getting to the conclusions that you reached now? Well, I had done some work on the Industrial Revolution in my book, Total Truth. And I looked at how that affected family structure. I looked at how that affected concepts of masculinity and femininity. But in that book, I was looking mostly at how it affected women, right? Because women used to play a big role in household, uh, household manufacture, right? The household industry. Um, and during the uh, Industrial Revolution, women lost access to economically productive work. And that affected their status greatly and is a big part of trying to make sense of you know, where does feminism come from. But and so I thought, well, maybe I will make that chapter into a whole book. And then I said, I'm bored with feminism. I have been through feminism so many times myself. It would be much more interesting to write about men because it's men who are now sort of in the crosshairs of, of our society. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the articles that made me decide I had to shift to men was an article in the Washington Post that was titled, Why Can't We Hate Men? Mm. And I was shocked, you know, that in mainstream publication, you can get away with that kind of language. A Huffington, Huffington Post editor said, hashtag kill all men. You can buy books that have extremely blunt titles like I hate men and no good men and are men necessary? And then there are males who are jumping on the bandwagon. A male author wrote a book in which he said, talking about healthy masculinity is like talking about healthy cancer. And the one that you may have seen, because uh, it was in the news only a few months ago, was um, the director of the movie Avatar, James Cameron, who said testosterone is a toxin that you have to work out of your system. So I was looking at these attacks against men and I thought, well, this would be a much more interesting topic than rehashing feminism again. Why does our modern culture get masculinity so wrong? That was the question I wanted to answer. Where is this coming from? You can't really stand against a social trend unless you know where it came from and how it developed. So that was my initial goal, is just to understand where did the concept come from that masculinity is toxic? Can I say, you do, you do a great job there. Uh, after reading your book, I had to reconsider a lot of things. Um, you, you talk in particular about, there, there's one thing that fascinates me, and the people that have met me or know me a little bit can immediately understand why it fascinated me. And it's when, I, I want to go to the Industrial Revolution, because that's where I, I think your thesis is a lot of things start happening there and start going wrong there. But what you what I found enlightening was when you mentioned the cowboy um, and the cowboy myth and how already there, cause I, you know, I grew up thinking, oh, I wish I could find a man like a, a true cowboy because there's something gentlemanly about the cowboy, right? He gives his words and he's going to come back, you know, maybe 20 years later, but he's going to come back. He said he was going to come back. He's going to keep his word. But you made me realize that already in that literature, there is already something missing. So what is it? And where, where, do, where do things start going wrong in the narrative about men? Yeah, the, the, the stages, I go through several stages of the development of a secular definition of masculinity. And they're, they're, they're very in, interconnected. So I might have to start with the Industrial Revolution, okay. as you said. Yeah. Um, you know, because most people think the term toxic masculinity started, say, in the 60s with second wave feminism. No, no, no. It's, you already see it in the 19th century. 
before the Industrial Revolution, men and women worked side by side all day on the family farm, the family industry, the family business. And so the cultural expectation of masculinity focused very much on their caretaking role. In fact, the very concept of authority back then meant you're the one responsible for the common good. You are supposed to sacrifice your own individual interests and look out for the interest of the whole. And so that was the cultural expectation placed on men. Where did we lose that concept of masculine virtue? Well, the Industrial Revolution takes work out of the home. And of course, men had, had to follow their work out of the home into factories and offices. And for the first time in American history, they were not working with people they loved and had a moral bond with, right? Their, their wives and children. Instead, they were working as individuals in competition with other men. And that was a very different ethos. So you can imagine that the, la the literature of the time started to change. For the first time, we see pe people start to complain that men were losing that caretaking ethos, that they were becoming egocentric, self-seeking, ambitious, aggressive, greedy and acquisitive, to use some of the language of the day, and turning financial success into an idol. So people began to complain that men's behavior was growing worse. And, and it actually did. This was also when America began to secularize because the Industrial Revolution created a sharp split between public and private, which had not been there. You know, when economic activity took place in the home, there wasn't a sharp split. But now they developed these very large public institutions like factories and offices and businesses and financial institutions, universities, and of course the state. And people began to say that these large public institutions should operate by scientific principles, by which they really meant value free. You know, don't bring your private values into the public realm, which is what we still hear today. Um, and since it was men who were getting that secular education and working in that secular field, um, their, their behavior became less bound to their religious convictions. And historians tell us that in the 19th century, there was a huge increase in fighting, gambling, drinking, prostitution, and crime. Um, sometimes a single fact can help crystallize it. In 1830, Americans drank three times as much as they do today. And so there's a reason- Which is not nothing, that you know, this saying, was followed yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a reason that this was followed by the creation of a huge network of reform movements, right? Starting with the temperance movement and the abolition movement and movements against sex trafficking and prostitution, um, movements to help quote unquote fallen women, um, a, a, a host of, of social reform movements. Now to get to the cow war, yeah. um, the trouble is that most of these reform movements were driven by women because, you know, women were not part of the economy yet. So they had the time, but also for the first time ever in human history, women were considered morally superior to men. Think of it this way. If values are kicked out of the public realm, where are they going to be cultivated? In the home. In the private realm. Yeah. And who's going to be responsible for cultivating them? women who were still home. And so for the first time, women were set up as the moral guardians of society. And that's why they were the ones running a lot of these reform movements. I'll give you can a I, quote can I, on this. Yeah, this and I it, hold mm -hmm. a quote because I just want our audience to think, close, I mean, close your eyes and think, how often do you think right now of a man as the one that transmits the value in the home? Almost never. That's, that's what I think most of the audience is going to think immediately. It's the mom as the woman. What Professor Percy is telling us today is that this is not a phenomenon that is as, as old as history, but it's actually very recent. And okay, back to the quote. Yes, yes. No, no, I'm so glad because I was hoping we'd come back to that. So we may as well stop and deal with it right now. Um, yeah, because so many people think this is just you know, eternal. We've always thought women were, were, were more, more moral, more spiritually sensitive than men. No, this, this came out of the 19th century. Through all of human history, there's never been a time before that women were considered morally superior to men. All the way back to the ancient Greeks and Romans, people thought men were morally stronger. And their, their reasoning went like this. 
the insight into rational uh, into right and wrong they thought was a rational insight and they thought men were more rational and therefore men were more virtuous in fact the word virtue comes from the latin the um the root is v-i-r which is latin for man, man as in the word viral uh, and so it really was thought that um the, the term uh, virtue had overtones of masculine strength and honor so this was a huge 180 degree turnaround and what happened then is for, for the first time in american history men were the villain you know women were seen as the moral guardians and men were the villain and and here's the quote i was going to get to uh, one of my favorite quotes is the trouble with the reform movements is that they tended to be focused on what were traditionally male vices like gambling and drinking and fighting and crime and, and prostitution. And so one historian puts it this way, there was little doubt as to the sex of the tavern keeper, the slave master, the drunkard, and the seducer. So men were suddenly set up as the, as the villains of the piece. And toward the end of the 19th century, they got, they got tired of that, not surprisingly. And that's where you see male fiction begin to change. Male fiction, like cowboy fiction, Westerns, mm -hmm. began to feature men who found their true authentic masculinity by escaping from civilization. Civilization had been too much taken over by women and their expectations and their moral demands. And therefore, men found their true self by going out and living with the cowboys and, and roping cattle or becoming frontier men or uh, Herman Melville, go out to sea, right? Melville said, I chose the sea because I saw it as a place of, quote, the utmost male license. That's how he described it. The most popular um, novel at the time was Last of the Mohicans. Mm -hmm. So all of the heroes of late 19th century and, and, and to some degree into the early 20th century were men who had escaped civilization. And that's why I critique it, because I say, you know, that's really not the godly definition of masculinity is escaping from marriage, escaping from women, escaping from civilization. And is that that's as, not what this is. based on what you explained, they're not escaping that what they're escaping from, they're not escaping from civilization or women in general. They're escaping from the this very novel idea of civilization as a very family divided model, right? Like uh, they're escaping the kind of woman that it's new in there in th at that time, which I imagine is dreadful because if all you have is a woman that is just going to, you know, reproach you for all your vices, which you probably develop simply because the industrial work is unbearable, right? And living with people that are not related to you and being out from 5 a.m. in the morning to 5 in the afternoon, right? Like in working. I mean, if I think of new what New York was, uh, mm. or, you know, when I, when I was at Princeton, like reading the life of the Irish people that died building the canals around Princeton, like if these, if these were the men and these were the kind of jobs, um, I understand that work is unbearable. You don't want to go home to someone that tells you that you should be sweet and kind and gentle. Right. Uh, at the same time, the, the, it sounds like the solution to the problem was going back uh, as Chesterton says, you know, progress is not necessarily to move, keep moving forward. Sometimes it's just going back to how things were. And instead, they decide, no, this is what women are. This is how a horrible family is. Therefore, I'm going to choose solitude and the life of the sailor or the cowboy or, right? Yeah. But so there is a misunderstanding, basically. That's what, that's what we're, we're, we're not blaming men for believing in this fiction, uh, we are blaming both sexes basically for not understanding that we were set up for failure at that point. Yeah, and you do see it today as well. I mean, again, one of the things about going through history is you find all the seeds of what's happening today. So the Manosphere, the group of online men's groups um, that are, tend to be very misogynist today, the Red Pillars and the Incels and the MGTOWs, which stands for Men Going Their Own Way, um, all of these men's rights groups tend to say, we need to get away from women. You can use them for sex, but don't get married. Marriage is too risky. A woman, you know, is, is a selfish, a selfish person who as soon as she gets bored is going to leave you, take the kids, take your money. 
uh, so don't get married. I mean, some of these same uh, tropes are still out there. They no longer have a frontier to go to, like the cowboys did, but they still are communicating the message that the way to to build yourself up as a man is not to get involved with women. So I think it's important to know the history so that we see where it's coming from. And by the way, and I love what you just said about going backwards. Here's what I, the solution I give in my book multiple times is I go back to what's called the cultural mandate. And it's a, th- it's a term that theologians use for Genesis, mm-hmm. right? Um, in Genesis, God creates the first human couple and the first thing he says to them is he tells them their purpose. Like, why, did, why did I create you? And it's be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. And be fruitful and multiply doesn't just mean nuclear family because anthropologists tell us all the social institutions grow historically out of the family. So it means, you know, the extended family, the clan, the tribe, the village, the nation, and then also social institutions to do specific purposes. Like you need a state, you need a church. You need a school, you need a marketplace. And so it's a very rich understanding of what men are called to, women too, but we're talking about men here. And then subdue the earth means harness the natural resources. So most societies start with agriculture, that mining and farming and technology and inventing computers and composing music, <laughs> writing books. By the way, one of my students once said, come on, composing music. And I said, I play the violin. Um, what's the violin made out of? Wood. And the bow? Horse hair. So all the transcendent beauty that you associate with music starts with harnessing the natural resources in, in God's creation. And so I think that if church, see churches right now, if they want to call men to a biblical masculinity, often have a very narrow understanding, you know, because of the sacred secular split, it seems that we're calling men to sit in church and pray and sing hymns. And that just doesn't seem very um, inspiring for many men. Yeah. But if you teach the cultural mandate in their work, in building up their civilization, building up their society, that gives them a much greater scope for accomplishment and achievement and impact and the things that are tend to be especially important for men, I, I think. And so recovering the cultural mandate, remember, that's pre-fall. So that yeah. was what God called us to, you know, that's what inherently, originally, we were called to do. You know, I sometimes think of it this way. The Bible teaches that the world has fallen, right? That there's sin. But sin took us off the track and salvation puts us back on the track. But we never ask, what was the track? What did God create human beings to do in this world? And it's called the cultural mandate because what he created us to do was create cultures, to create civilizations, to make history. And I think when churches and Christian organizations communicate that message, it will have a much greater appeal for men. Yeah, and it is clear that it, it requires a family, a cultural mandate, because unless you have a man and a woman coming together, you do not have offspring, so you do not have anything to transmit and to pass on to anyone. So it's clear that that is going to be the beginning. And any solution that suggests that the two sexes should be divided it's already, it's by definition, it's wrong. So what we need to understand is how can we live, what, what is rediscover the beauty of that complementarity. And I really think that you do a great job in your book in explaining to both men and women what went wrong. One very beautiful insight that you have there that I would like for you to say a couple of words on it are the two, the difference that historically developed between the idea of a good man and the idea of a real man. And you also say, you know, like if I tell, I think there is like an example of like, if people want to be, you know, you tell them, do you want to be a good man or a real man? And like men are going to say, I want to be a real man, right? Like, so would you say, would you, would you say something, like a, a couple of comments on this? Because I, I think it's going to be um, reveal, like it's, it's going to teach a lot. Yeah, it's going to explain a lot. Yeah, um, I put it right at the front of the book, precisely because it does explain a lot. The background is that this book has been the most controversial book I've written, which surprised me. I didn't realize masculinity is a bigger trigger trigger word than than you know some of the book some of the uh, topics I dealt with in my earlier book, Love Thy Body, which was abortion, homosexuality, transgenderism. I really thought that would be the most controversial book. So I always have a lot of reading groups on the manuscript when it's in preparation. 
And when, when my participants would talk to their family and friends and say they're going through a manuscript on masculinity, invariably the first question was, whose side is she on? You know, uh, And men tended to assume that a woman writing a book on masculinity would be a male bashing feminist. Mm. And more progressive types tended to assume I was you know, an angry culture warrior. So I put this study at the front of the book. It's a sociologist who's very well known. And so he gets invited to speak all around the world. And he came up with a very clever experiment where he asked young men themselves, what does it mean? The, the first two questions. The, the first question is, what does it mean to be a good man? If you're at a funeral and in the eulogy, somebody says he was a good man, what does that mean? And the sociologist said all around the globe, men had no trouble answering that. They would immediately start listing things like, honor, duty, integrity, sacrifice, do the right thing, look out for the little guy, mm -hmm. and be responsible, be a provider, be a protector. And the sociologist would say, where'd you learn that? And they would say, I don't know, it's just in the air we breathe. Or he said, if they were in a Western country, they would often say it's part of our Judeo-Christian heritage. Mm -hmm. Then he would follow up though with the second question. And he'd say, what, is, what does it mean to you if I say to you, man up, be a real man? And the young men themselves would say, oh no, that's completely different. That means be tough, never show weakness, play through pain, win at all costs, um, be competitive, get rich, get laid. I'm using their language. And so the sociologists concluded that there is a universal, global, innate sense of what it means to be a good man. I would say men are created in God's image and they do understand that their unique masculine strengths are not given them just to get whatever they want, but to serve, protect, provide for those that they love. But they also do feel the cultural pressure, uh, which they, they, they connect with the phrase, the real man, mm -hmm. which focus on much different traits, right? And if it does get disconnected from a moral ideal, it can slide into things like, things we consider toxic, like uh, uh, entitlement, dominance, control, and so on, um, contempt for those who are weaker. So I thought this was a fascinating because it means that we have a much better way to approach these issues. When we talk to men, they don't respond very well to being called toxic, right? Nobody would. But what we can do is say, can we tap into that innate, universal sense of the good man? Can we? affirm it? Can we support it? Can we encourage it? Um, and, and that would give us a much more positive way to approach these issues. And do, would you agree with me? I don't know. I mean, we, you're, we're in different stages maybe in life, but I, I, my intuition was that you would agree with me. Let's see if I'm right or wrong. That we need to, to train to teach also women to like the good man. There is somehow teach men to like, oh, no, teach women like that, that we also, right. We, we read the same books. We watched the same TV and you have a great, great point there on Homer Simpson and family guy, which I would love for you to say more about that, but that maybe women themselves are looking too much for the rowdy, um, man, the man that, you know, doesn't need to ask, blah, blah, blah. And like, and whatever, whenever a man shows signs of being a good man is actually, considered a loser or uh, someone that is not worth attention. Yes, yes. One of the key um, stages, I said I went through several stages in the development of the secular script. One of the most important ones was the rise of Darwinian evolution. And that's surprising for most people because they think that's about science. But the social Darwinist had a huge impact on concepts of masculinity. What they said was the men who came out on top in the struggle for survival would be the men who were brutal, tough, um, ruthless, savage, barbarian, and predatory. And so instead of urging men to live up to the image of God in them, they urged men to live down, to find their authentic masculinity by getting in touch with what they called the beast within, you know, their animal nature. And so this was a huge part of why we now tend to almost define the, the real man as being sort of tough, and mean and out there. Um, and it's not just the social Darwinists. It, it, it's still happening because social Darwinism has a new label now. It's called evolutionary psychology. But books are still being written from that perspective. One of them is uh, a best-selling book 
called The Moral Animal. And the author says, the human male is a possessive, oppressive, flesh-obsessed pig. Giving a man advice on how to have a good marriage is like giving a Viking a booklet on how not to pillage. And I thought, first of all, I thought, you, really? You can get away with being this negative toward men? You sound worse than any feminist. But another book was, uh, recently came out, too. It, well, it's an older book that was just reissued called Men in Marriage. And he, too, says the human male is by nature irresponsible, addiction-prone, violent, and sexually predatory. His deepest yearning is not for wife and family but for the motorbike and the open road for the male group i'm trying to remember his exact words yeah. here the male group escape to a primal mode of predatory and immediate gratification i thought really this is not how god created men you know, yeah this sounds- is what people have gotten and, and gotten I the know- idea that this this is not this is not genuine strength Go ahead. We, no, we we sometimes use you know we we use evolutionary psychology. So, and I want to say it because even when we talk, when we talk about why you know the easy access to sex was a problem for women, we we tend to use evolutionary psychology by saying men are only going to look for more praise if given the chance, to, right? If you don't if you don't create the marriage commitment in order for men to have sex, they will be naturally inclined to. But what I would like to stress, because I, I, I totally agree with you, like that describing men based on evolutionary psychology is wrong in the in the sense that evolutionary psychology only explains some of our instincts, but it doesn't in speaking about men here, but it's as if it only took for real the bad in the vices. <laughs> and not our instincts for the good, right? So it's it, it's only looking at us based on our basest passions. And here I could quote how Del Noche, Italian philosopher, at some point realizes that we 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 came to believe that what is true is only the, what is basis, the base, like what is mm-hmm. what is the most natural and the most depraved about us is true, and whatever is virtue, whatever takes requires some of our use of rationality is by definition less true. Um, And here's the point that I think an evolutionary psychologist approach, including to marriage, misses, right? Because that marriage doesn't make sense uh, on that perspective. Um, But what do you think, though, you know, of of someone like, let's let's mention him, Jordan Peterson, um, who spoke to a lot of men and I would say did a lot of good using psychology where do you think is the limit, right? Because I, I see, I agree with you that there is a problem in using evolutionary psychology, but I also see that somehow it can be very good to understand how we are wired. So where where is the balance yeah, well, there? Yeah. I think the negative use of evolutionary psychology, psychology is the intellectual roots of the Andrew Tate phenomenon. You know, when you read serious, thoughtful people saying men are just naturally sexually promiscuous and there's nothing you can do about that. Um, or, or the other side of it is they'll say, and it's up to women to tame them, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's up to women to hold them in check because uh, they are naturally the raging beast, you know, just barely under the surface. It's the Andrew Tate phenomenon that, that it explains, that fast cars, fast money, fast women. And, uh, and by the way, have you seen this, uh, the New York Post has uh, celebrated what they call the new Andrew Tate. His name is Myron Gaines, and he's becoming very popular too. And his tagline is, I help men, I help men transform from simps into pimps. And both of them say men are naturally promiscuous. And yes, they can have maybe a favorite good girlfriend, but we have to understand that they will always have a lot of other girlfriends on the side because that's just the, the male nature. And the woman has to understand that too. That yeah, the tragedy is that women are believing that, right? Like what, what I was saying yes. earlier is that women are believing. It's not only that men are, but we are somehow helping men having a lower bar and lower standards for themselves. And women are believing it and accepting horrible partners in their lives that use this. I've, I've heard this language. Like I've heard mm. it from real people in three dimensions say, you know, this is just the way we are. And... I mean, I hear, you know, I see women that do not run away from someone that talks like that. 
So is this like, do we all need a wake up call, both men and women and saying, no, 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 no. Like you're both called to a lot more. Well, the, the, on the women's side, what's happened is um, we talked about in the 19th century when women were for the first time ever considered morally superior and were given the task of being the moral guardians of society. In many ways, what feminism did, starting like with the flappers in the 1920s, roughly, what feminists, what feminists began to say is, we're tired of being the policemen. You know, we're tired of being the moral, um, the, the moral conscience of men. You know, we want to have fun, too. And so like the flappers uh, wanted, to, they wanted to go to movies and read trashy novels and smoke and drink and go to bars and go to nightclubs, just like men did. And that, that was the objection against the, the flappers is, well, wait a minute, instead of holding men in check, they're starting to imitate men. That's not a good thing. So that's why they were so controversial. But I think that they do represent a shift when, when women said we're not putting up with the double standard anymore because that puts all the responsibility on us. So you can kind of see where they were coming from. But as a result, ever since then, women have tried to be just as raunchy as men, right? And, and, and to imply that somehow it's okay for them to sleep around in the same way that it used to be thought okay for men, or still is. <laughs> um, or it's just you know, that women can have casual sex just like a man can. And that uh, women don't don't have different or higher standards. So that's what we're seeing is that women. It's not just that they're putting up with these men, but it's almost like that's that's their way of showing that they no longer accept the double standard that they're on the same level as men. And uh, the the word that was used in the early 20th century of the flappers was women are aping men. That was the word that was often used. Yeah, they were. They were starting to say, why should men have all the fun? And why should we be the ones who are held responsible in society? And by the way, that, that doesn't mean that this double standard is gone. I do talk to young people, especially young people, um, who say it's still very much there. I, I was, in, I was uh, interviewed by a young married couple not too long ago. And so I decided to turn the interview back on them. And I said, mm -hmm. you know, tell me, you know, in the Christian world, because they were very much, you know, in, into the Christian world of church and so on. I said, do you think that there's still a double standard? And they said, totally. Even in the Christian world, it is assumed that men are just naturally more prone to sin and vice and pornography and sexual sin and so on uh, and, and addiction. And that it's the woman in the relationship who has to hold, hold the line, you know, be the one who tries to you know, keep, keep, keep all that sin under the, under the cover um, keep them going to church. And like you said earlier, even things like, you know, who is the one who leads um, spiritually in the home? And so I think that this this is a much bigger problem, I think, and, than maybe we have realized. And, and not only is a double standard, but as I was trying to say before, women do not even believe that there is a chance to find a man that is better than that. Like, because we've accepted that ourselves, we do not believe that there can be such thing as a man that can be the spiritual guide of the home. And if there is one that looks like that, we we'll start being suspicious and skeptical. As like, is it is he really manly? I, you mentioned at the beginning your your uh, bad experience, and I think we're speaking also right now to a, an audience, to two generations, that probably instead of you know just picturing yourself as the toxic man or the woman that got it all wrong, we are also the children of those people. And mm -hmm. so, what I would like, you know, what we could talk about now is how these models are destroying whoever comes after us um, you mentioned in your book the importance of the father and son bond and I think you, you 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 put a lot of stress of like how the bad masculinity that we face today is because that bond was severed like the the, the father was no more in the home But also in this okay. man, in this yes. world where marriage doesn't last and everyone can be promiscuous and sleep around, like there is a constant victim, and that victim are the children of of those two people. So yeah, if you can say more about the, that, this father son and fa father daughter, like the father in the house, yeah, yeah. Because and you mentioned earlier that the fathers are mocked and ridiculed in the media today, and uh, pe people know that, but they don't know where it came from. And once again, it started after the Industrial Revolution because we're so used to fathers being out of the home that we no longer realize it was a huge shock at the time. People felt like the family had just been gutted because the central figure of the family was gone all day. 
And this was a new thing. Parents Magazine, 1842, said the greatest source of domestic sorrow is that the father feels like he has to work early and late, early and late, and no longer fulfills his duties to his children. And another 19th century writer wrote, God is our father, and yet the prototype of the divine is not even in the home from Sunday to Sunday. Remember, they still work Saturdays. From Sunday to Sunday, the father's gone. And the leading psychologist of the day even wrote this. He said, you know, boys are no longer being supervised by their fathers. And so their behavior is growing wild and unmanageable. And here's, here's his, an exact quote. He said, never before has the American boy been so wild and so half orphaned. You know, because the father wasn't there. It was like being half an orphan. And he said, and then he said, as, as a result, children are being left to female guidance in home, school, and church. And so it was, it was a huge change at the time. And that's when we first start seeing fathers described in negative language because they were no longer in touch with the family dynamics. They were gone too, too much. So they didn't really know their children's thoughts and feelings as well. And so already then we start to see the literature de describe fathers as out of touch, irrelevant, superfluous, and incompetent. So that's when it started. The seeds of the Homer Simpson paradigm started already in the 19th century. And it's because fathers were out of the home. And so you're right. I do put a lot of stress on that. You realize that you probably know because you guys have probably done the studies. But 40% of American children are growing up apart from their natural father. It is the highest rate of single parenthood in the world. And so I do give some time to... Um, a couple of chapters, in fact, to fatherhood. How can we restore fatherhood? How can we, I mean, even practical things like uh, we can't undo the industrial revolution, but can we flex the workplace to allow fathers more time with their children? And the pandemic actually was a game changer. Um, Harvard University did a study. It's not in the book because it's more recent. Harvard did a study in which they concluded 68, during the pandemic, 68% of men said they got closer to their children and they don't want to lose that. So they do prefer some kind of a hybrid situation, you know, some form of flexibility so that they can stay in close contact with their children. They, they found out they actually like being close to their children. But of course, then you have to get the corporations on board too. So in my book, I found CEOs who said things like, one of them said, uh, we were always hesitant to allow for remote work, right? Because because they thought people would stop off. And he said, during the, the pandemic completely exploded that fear. We did not see any drop in productivity. So we can bring this to our corporations and CEOs and say, you know, there, there is a good case. Uh, oh, yes, I, I quote one CEO who said, if you give fathers time to be better fathers, they make better workers. You know, yeah. they're more motivated on the job. So it is a win-win. Yeah, the, very few people are focused on the long-term results. But, you know, if everyone understood how much we're set up for failure right now, probably we, we could think again at the long-term result. And it's right that you give a lot of practical advice, and it's true. And there, that's why I I not didn't only want to discuss this book. I will also want to recommend it to boys and girls to read, but to parents too, because I think you give a lot of very sensible advice. Um, for how, how, you know, can parents be good parents and how can fathers be good fathers and good fathers to good men, not just rowdy men, you know, growing up. So I think that that is a very good reason um, to get your book, to read it. Um, and, to, and, and, and I do believe that if we all want, if we all understand that what we've been sold as the image of men and women is not, what makes us happy things can change mm. because ultimately that's all we want like yeah. people are doing the wrong things because they still think this is going to make them happy people follow andrew tate mm -hmm. because they do think that having 15 <laughs> girls is better than having one um and then you know let me give you another study yeah, so, yeah. another study on men in particular this was the longest study ever done 80 years by harvard university what, what makes men happy and with an 80 year study, they found it was not fame or financial success or 
you know, all the normal things we expect. It was relationships. The men who were happiest were the men who had solid, deep, committed relationships. And it just is so counter to our stereotypes, right? To the, the real man stereotype. He has 80 years of study and men themselves were happiest if they had reliable relationships. And, and I'm not adverse also to appealing to men's self-interest. There have been some wonderful studies on what men benefit from in becoming fathers. Uh, there's, a, there's a nest of neurons in the brain that don't get activated unless a man becomes a father. Yeah. They actually call it the dad brain. So your brain actually grows when you become a father. And I think that's a, that your... could explain to a lot of young women, you know, it sounds, it sounds stupid, but why they might be attracted to young fathers more than they are to their bachelor's friends. And it's not just because, you know, some, something because you're jealous of what's, but there is something new and different in a man once he becomes a father. And as you say, it has been demonstrated. Same thing with mothers, right? Like there is, there is a nurturing side of women that only shows up when they need, when they have to take care of their little one. And, um, and that's why men are, you know, they, they just adore their wives when they're pregnant. And when they are like, I mean, except for like certain moments when they don't like each other, I've been told that there are some difficult moments, um, in a marriage, especially when kids are, are very young, but setting jokes aside, um, there is a lot of the complication in the beautiful nature that we have and the complementary nature that we have that, our culture is missing. Um, and it's, yeah. And it's biochemical too. It's biochemical because one, one reason women become more nurturing is because the rise of oxytocin, which is called the bonding hormone. And so, you know, women have a little biochemical boost in bonding to this baby who's going to take a lot of time and effort and sacrifice. But what surprised people is they found out recently that fathers get a biochemical boost as well. Their oxytocin goes up when a baby's born. It, it's uh, triggered by tactile sense. So they have to be actually holding and touching and playing with their baby. And, and then the most recent one, and the biggest surprise uh, by an anthropologist, um, found that a man's oxytocin is rising all through his wife's pregnancy, all nine months. Wow. Apparently no one ever thought to test a man's blood before during his wife's pregnancy. But when they did, they found he is being biochemically primed all through her pregnancy to be a more engaged and, and connected father. So the biochemistry is on our side and I'm very thankful for that. You know, you, you made me uh, understand a little better why I have some young friends, uh, men that are like fathers of six or seven. They probably, you know, they have their experiences, all, all the, experiencing all these cycles of oxytocin and they just get addicted to it. So hopefully more people will get addicted to it since we have a fertility problem right now and a family problem, a marriage problem. But within amongst all this problem, we have amazing authors and professors like you, uh, like the scholars that have wor worked with the US Institute. Um, and a lot of people are engaged in this um, cultural, uh, I don't like to call it fight, but like this, um, this journey, let's call it a journey. Um, I want to thank you. We've already taken a lot of your time and uh, I know you're busy with a lot of interviews and, but I want to recommend again, your book to the people that are listening. And um, if there is something that you wanted to say that I left out uh, that you think is important or like a closing, closing thoughts for our audience. Um, well, there's one area of research we didn't quite touch on, and that is that um, the, the research on Christian men, which was kind of surprising, because most people think, I mean, the cultural, cultural stereotype is that Christian men are the exhibit A of toxic masculinity. And so there have been a lot of research studies done on it. You guys are so into research, you probably know most of these studies. Um, the largest one was done by Brad Wilcox at the University of Virginia, who I know you guys connect with. Mm -hmm. But surprisingly... Um, he found that committed church-going Christian men tested out the highest as the most loving and engaged husbands and fathers. Their wives report the highest levels of happiness. They spend more time with their kids, 3.5 hours more per week than secular men. They divorce at a lower rate, 35% lower than secular couples, and they have the lowest rate of domestic abuse and violence. So if we want to ask, you know, what can we do to help men become better men and fathers, um, there's a resource sitting right in front of us. Now, I, I have to say, this is not well known. I had to go digging in the academic literature to find this. 
Um, so really what we need to do is get this out. This, you know, this is not a pep talk from some religious leader. This is you know, genuine evidence-based findings that we should be bringing into our churches to start with to help encourage Christian men, but also be confident in bringing it into the public rom- domain to counter to the, the negative media stereotypes. That the abusive men are the religious, the, the, the church going ones. Yeah, absolutely. You, <clears throat> There are some studies that do show that the ones that call themselves Christians but are not practicing their faith are actually the worst cohort. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because for, for balance, I think we need to acknowledge that. that um, and it was Brad Wilcox, the one we've mentioned, who did the most thorough study where he uh, the first feed, the first pushback I always get is, but haven't we all heard that Christians divorce at the same rate as the rest of culture? And so people like Brad Wilcox went back to the data and they separated out the men who really are committed and attend church regularly from the nominals, right? N-O-M is Latin for name. So that means in name only, so the cultural Christians. And you're right. They test out with all of the toxic stereotypes. The wives report the lowest level of happiness. They spend less time with their kids. They have the highest rate of divorce, 20% higher than secular couples. And they have the highest rate of domestic abuse and violence of any group in America, higher than secular men. So we've got to keep both of these in mind. It is the nominals who are in in a sense, uh, you know, who are just identifying as evangelicals who are in a, uh, uh, creating the negative stereotypes that are so common in our culture. So, yeah, so that probably, people no longer even... Yeah, so no, what I was yeah, saying is that maybe if we have to give yeah. a suggestion to women, it's not just look for, you know, what they say they are, but look at, like, how they behave and what they do, right? Yes, good point. And I, I was a little bit concerned. You know, I hang out, right, with sort of committed nice men. I thought the nominals would be a small group. Actually, it's about the same size. So when you... It, it, there's a 50-50 chance. Like, a young woman needs to know this. There's a 50 50 yeah. chance that if she meets a man who claims to be a Christian, you know, he may be either really committed and mean it, or he may be nominal. Yeah, so maybe suggest a date on a Sunday for a couple of times and see if, he, if he's <laughs> ever right. busy doing something else or if he's always free, right? That could be some practical advice. Um, Professor Piercy, Nancy, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, again, thank you for your, your, what you put into this book, including your personal story. Uh, and I hope to read more of you. I still have to get to Love Thy Body, but I think it's going to be my next read. So maybe if you're willing to discuss that at some point, uh, if it's not too old for you, uh, we might try to contact you again. Yeah, great idea. That would be good. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's been a joy talking with you. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening, and we hope you enjoyed the episode of our show, What We Can Not Talk About. If you did like the episode, remember to share it among your friends. Do not forget to subscribe. And if you can, please donate to the Austin Institute. Your donations make it possible for us to continue to do this. But above all, they support our local programming and the important, if not crucial, research of our fellows. Thank you.